Hello, and welcome to the Yale Center for British Arts online series at home, Artists in Conversation. I'm Freda Spira, Robert L. Soli, Curator of Prints and Drawings at the Yale University Art Gallery. And I'm delighted to welcome artist Emma Stibben to the program today. Before oh, we begin, <laughs> wonderful to have you here. Before we begin, I have a few housekeeping notes. Please note that this program is being recorded. Your camera and sound are muted and will remain so throughout the program. We will be using the Q&A feature located on your navigation bar to gather your questions for Emma and they will be answered at the end of the program. But please feel free to submit your questions at any time. If you would like closed captioning, a live transcript is available by clicking the icon on your navigation bar. I'd also like to read a land acknowledgement. Yale University acknowledges that indigenous people and nations, including Mohegan, Mashantucket, Pequot, Eastern Pequot, Scaticoke, Golden Hill, Pogaset, Nahatek, and the Quinnipiac, and other Algonquin speaking people have stewarded through generations the lands and waterways of what is now the state of Connecticut. We honor and respect the enduring relationship that exists between these people and nations and this land. I wanna now introduce our artist, Emma Stibben. British artist, royal academician, and intrepid traveler, Emma is an artist whose works on paper consider the complexities of extreme environments undergoing transition. She studied fine arts at Goldsmiths, and she has a master's from the University of the West of England. Notably for our talk here, Emma, wor Emma worked in paper conservation at a museum just after art school where she not only looked closely at the amazing artistry of the works themselves, but also began to explore the connections between art and science. She's participated in residencies, including the Arctic Circle Residency, the Queen Sonia Print Award Residency in Skalvbard, the Hawaii Volcanoes National Park, and the National Park Arts Foundation in Death Valley, the artist residence Antarctica in Antarctica with HMS Protector and Scott Polar Research Institute, the Joseph and Annie Albers Foundation here in Connecticut, and the British School at Rome. Recent exhibitions include Desert Sublime at the University of San Diego, Vanishing Point at Gallery Bastien Berlin, and Fire and Ice at the Alan Christea Gallery in London. Working from her studio at Spike Island and Spike Print Studio in Bristol, Stibben self-publishes the majority of her prints. She's work, her work is represented by Christea Roberts Gallery in London and Gallery Bastian in Berlin. And her work is held in private and public collections, including the Stadt Museum Berlin, Bristol City Museum and Art Gallery, the Fitzwilliam Museum Cambridge and the Victoria and Albert Museum in London. Emma, I'm so thrilled to be speaking with you today. Welcome. Oh, thank you so much, Freda. And uh, yeah, it's a real pleasure actually to speak to, well, to a wider audience than just the UK. It's, it's a real honor to, to be talking here at Yale. Great. I've just come off working on an exhibition about notions of place in Danish 19th century art and feel extremely connected to the ideas of how landscapes change over periods of time and how much more at a distance many of us feel to nature in the 21st century. I also recognize how drawings play a central role in the history of the art of landscape, both on an intimate and very personal level as a tool to work through ideas, the fall of light and shadow, perspective and point of view while literally embedded in nature, as well as drawings on a grander scale that are more finished works likely completed in the studio and at a distance. Can we advance the slide? Emma, can you speak about how you approach your subject and what draws you to it? Can I also ask, because I know you're very humble about your amazing adventures, 
to speak about the intellectual side of your practice, but also a little bit about the physical side and how that affects your drawing, what the need to describe remote landscapes, unearthing of places that are connected in ways that break national, political, and cultural boundaries, but are connected in other ways. Well, thank you, Freda. Yes, I, I, I guess, you know, my work, well, it's obviously rooted in landscape, um, the kind of environments that are undergoing change and transformation. Um, and that sort of physical change in landscape, uh, you know, through geological events like uh, erosion or um, kind of events that occur over a very long geolog geological time is something that's long preoccupied me. Uh, but, you know, we, you know, I'm, I'm conscious as we all are now, we're living through these unprecedented times where um, climate warming has become our kind of main narrative. So um, inevitably, you know, I, I think that's really driving my work these days. Um, I guess as an artist, you know, that's, that's a kind of commitment that I feel, you know, that I want to represent my first-hand observations um, out in the field uh, of what I'm actually seeing you know, and the kind of impact that's that's taking on the places that I'm visiting. Um, and often that obviously leads me to quite remote places. You know, I'm very fortunate. I get to see places like Antarctica and the high Arctic, you mentioned Svalbard. Um, and, you know, those, those projects, I definitely, you know, need that sort of in the field experience, that sort of physical, um, visceral encounter of being in a place so um, you know being out there in the elements and then yeah using my sketchbook drawing I tend not to actually work from a sketchbook as such I've just got sort of leaves of paper that I'll work on um, just directly working from from the subject um, and then you know my digital camera which obviously I'm using to to record observations that I might make also sort of experiences which I think drawing is able to do that you know it has that uh, kind of emotional sense of an interpretation when you're looking Just wonderful <laughs> yes and there. uh yeah the small scale drawings that you were uh, seeking of it's interesting that you don't draw from a sketchbook but from sheets of paper which actually makes much more sense nowadays <laughs> Can you speak about um, the kinds of materials that you bring with you when you go into the field? And can you also speak about how you work differently in the field than you do in the studio? Yeah, that's a good question. I, um, you know, when I'm out on location and I've got these uh, sheets of paper, probably around sort of A3 or A4 size, um, here I've got two watercolors um, on show um, on the screen of an Antarctic um, ice front, a couple of ice fronts that we passed on the ship. Um, and I'm trying to sort of really rapidly get that down on the page, you know, as we're passing uh, these incredible kind of monumental, fragile really ice sheets now, of course. Um, and using mostly wet materials, because I, I kind of have a sense of wanting to get it down on the page quite quickly. Um, so ink or watercolour generally, um, something that I think offers that sort of atmospherics of, of place, you know, of the light falling on something. Quite often the light is quite eerie in Antarctica, for example. So um, yeah, watercolor or ink has got that lovely kind of nuance of wash and tonality. Um, and talking to your question about how drawing, you know, from observation is different to being in the studio. Um, obviously, you know, it's it's more urgent. I've got to kind of work against the elements of weather and often it's windy or cold etc um, and I think that makes it more of a sort of provisional um, you know less subconscious way of making a mark on a page um, and I, I, it's very sort of strange that when I look back at the sketchbook drawings you know I'm not really making judgments around making art it's just sort of get it down as I'm sort of witnessing something uh, and I can, whether it's a good drawing or bad drawing, I can really um, travel back to the time that I did it when I look back at the drawing. So there's a kind of strange um, transformation, a, a kind of memory that happens when I've made something, a mark on a piece of paper. I don't know what that is. Um, it'd be interesting to identify what that is. I don't get the same thing when I look back at my photographs. Um, 
which are, are much more of a sort of objective view of something. Do you, um, like earlier artists, often um, record on your sketchbooks the date or time or place that you're drawing them? Yes, I do. And, and yeah, I've kind of learned kind of to do that quite disciplined now, even to the time of day, um, particularly if there's a sort of sequence of events that's happening over a period. So um, as I say, when you're, you're in the moment of doing it, it's easy to overlook that sort of reflective moment but um for example I recently made a series of works up in Svalbard and it was more to take my mind off the uh the kind of weather and the seasickness that I was having because it was a really really rough crossing across the Barent Sea um and I must have made about 30 drawings sorry these are not them but uh uh the ice in the air was as we were literally tracking north it just got colder and colder and you could see that in the drawings in the sequence of drawings as I looked over them later that the uh kind of evidence of that freezing media um really shows in the drawing so um it was quite a nice kind of log of weather in terms of the chronology of them that's wonderful thank you um, so to speak about uh, the studies of icebergs that we're looking at now, can you speak about this idea of temporality of time in your drawings and how it relates to a sense of time in the landscape? I'm also curious about your practice of drawing on sheets of paper that are quite ephemeral in themselves and your recording of this idea of the transience of nature. Yes, definitely paper is something that I have a real affinity for. You mentioned earlier about being a conservator of works of art and paper in my earlier other life. And I um, I definitely find there's something kind of very, you know, it's a very delicate subject paper, but actually it's incredibly strong. And um, I, I like the fact when I'm out sort of in the wet or weathers that it bears witness to that kind of the way the media goes down. If, if the, I think you can see in the top left and the bottom right hand, sketches here that that the evidence of snow in the watercolor media where it's sort of spotted there um, and yeah it can get kind of quite wet and uh, almost to the point of disintegrating but um, that sort of adds to the um, kind of witness of the place I think that it's embedded in the media um, and these these little group of drawings are again are from like probably I can't remember how many I made of all the bergs that we passed but I was really trying to kind of set down an impression of something that is quite transient and fleeting. Obviously, icebergs are melting. They, you know, before my eyes, they'd be kind of rotating in the sea or even breaking up in front of me. Um, and, and something about maybe almost like a portrait of something that's at a moment in time and to kind of try and capture that. So, um, that sense of temporality that you talked about, I think is important uh, in terms of drawing and the process of looking, which obviously is much more time-based than the camera lens, which is a sort of fraction of a second. Um, and yes, I do think that um, the kind of temporality of taking something down on paper um, and the act of looking and the kind of hand gesture is is special to drawing particular to drawing um so yes i i i sort of i don't really set out when i'm working in a sketchbook to have any i just literally open myself out to what i'm looking at uh, and then obviously sort of review all of that back in the studio later so just to return to the idea of paper i know that you're very interested in different kinds of paper and using different kinds of paper um, when you go into the field, do you bring um, different types of paper and think about the surfaces and how they will affect the drawings? Or is that something you do more in your studio? Well, I probably just take what is reliable because if I'm going somewhere like Antarctica, the luggage sort of limitations are quite tight. So um, I, I need it to be reliable. So <laughs> I'm not too experimental. Uh, when I'm out on location uh, but yeah back in the studio I'll, I'll kind of test out different surfaces yeah now quite boring on, on the sketchbook it's usually a cartridge kind of fairly heavyweight cartridge great um, turning to the studio uh, can you speak a little about your artistic process earlier you were mentioning the camera 
Can you speak a little about the difference between drawing and taking photographs, or perhaps you don't feel that they're different at all? Uh, no, photography is, is definitely back in the studio an important part of the process. Um, I mean, I, I go through all of these. Um, I must do thousands of, take thousands of a digital, I'm sure we all do when we're out. Um, I'm literally, I'm really sort of, in fact, quite often it's the sort of ambient, rather uncomposed photographs that I find more interesting later. So I'll, I'll sort of trawl through all these thousands of photographs and then probably print out several hundred of them, which I quite like an old fashioned, you know, set of photographs, which I'll spread all over the what you can see in the in the photograph there. Um, and then together with my sketchbook drawings, I'll um, quite often sort of montage things or collage. Uh, I, I love the photocopier as well. I'll quite often put things on the photocopier and then um, I'm quite sort of not not too uh, techy. I'll use scissors and cut things out and montage, maybe overdraw directly on the photocopies. Um, so I, I'm quite kind of, uh, you know, I'm not tied to, I'm not topographically accurate. Um, I'm quite happy to uh, move things around and cut and shut things. Um, because really, I guess, uh, I'm sort of thinking around the compositional arrangement of, of um, the image. And uh, yeah, the, the photo photography is important because it captures all the sort of information, um, but the sketchbook drawings are what take me back to the experience of being in the place. I think I've got a much stronger um, sensory impression of what I remember when I look back at my sketchbook drawings. Um, so sort of combination of, of the two. Wonderful. Um, I love how you talk about um, with the collaging things together where it's not needing to be topographically perfect, um, but that you take sort of pieces from different things and put them together to create sort of um, sort of a platonic ideal of what it could be maybe, or is it just in terms of fitting a composition or an idea that you have for what it is supposed to mean? I think it, it might be more to do with the um, sense of the place, the kind of an emotional memory of the place. Um, I mean, it would be recognizable. I'm not saying I'd, I'd, I'd sort of completely fictionalize or I have some sort of idealization of what, what I want to put down, but, um, uh, and it's definitely rooted in the knowledge of the place, like being in front of it is vital. I don't think I could sort of source things from a, you know, second, like from the internet it wouldn't kind of have the same resonance. Um, but yeah, I, I mean, for an example, what well, probably you might want to, to bring us into the studio now. Um, yes, absolutely. Can you talk about sort of your grander scale works and how you think about creating works that will be hung on the wall and exhibited? Yeah, so leading, yes, into the studio, the, the larger works, which obviously I, I don't make in front of the subject, um, it differs differs in terms of drawing um, because, because I do work on quite a large scale. For example, this one, sorry, it's in metric to our USA. I guess 185 centimeters is about seven foot long, sort of wide width ways by about four foot, just over four foot height wise. So that would be a sort of medium size for me. Um, and made in watercolor and uh, graphite powder. Um, I sort of want the reason for the big scale is that sort of sense of encounter for the viewer. I really want the sort of sense about being immersed in something for, for, for an audience that might sort of see that in a space um, to give a sense of the physicality of being in front of it. You know, I'm, I'm enormously privileged that I get to some of these places that most people won't get to. And, and I, I feel there's something really kind of special about the the sensory um, kind of witness of that, that I want to be in the drawing. So practically handling wet materials on a very large piece of paper, um, you know, I have to sort of be quite planned about that when I approach the drawing. Um, I'm working between the floor, I'm going to quite often have the paper on the floor, and then I have a rig on the wall, which I'll sort of raise it on like a flag when it's wet. So I quite, if I'm wanting to get a, 
a run, say in the sky there, if the paper's upside down, I'll sort of have it hanging on the wall to, to so it's quite kind of physical and um, obviously paper's got limits to how much you can, uh, you know, you're not just left holding the wet corners of something. So that that's all quite planned um, in the studio. Um, and yeah, I, I think the kind of properties of, of those rather simple materials of drawing, you know, you've just got paper, um, you know, some pigments um, in watercolour and, and maybe ink, like a bit of carbon. And I find it really magical at drawing. You can sort of conjure up these big sort of apparently 3D things out of some quite sort of basic materials. Um, and I, I think that's quite kind of, um, yeah, it's quite magical really. I don't, not, not claiming my drawing is magical, but I just think it is quite incredible how something quite simple you can do a lot of, um, a lot of things with. Um, and just speaking to the obviously the subject, the fact it's a glacier tongue, you know, I, I've been looking at uh, polar ice sheets and uh, glaciers for some time now, um, you know, incredibly beautiful and, uh, you know, the kind of wonder of seeing that. Uh, but of course, you know, set against, you know, where we are now, our awareness about climate warming and that sort of significant retreat that we're seeing in, in polar ice caps and glaciers across the world. Um, and I, I just feel, uh, you know, I want the drawings to have a sense of beauty, but also a sort of resonance about um, something that is is changing and, and disappearing in our in our lifetimes. Yeah. yeah. Can I ask, um, I guess, some technical questions about working in the studio on such a large scale? Do you create um, an underdrawing in graphite for these large watercolors? Um, and do you work with studio assistants? <laughs> that would be nice. Actually, uh, <laughs> sorry, answering the um, the, the underdrawing, uh, yeah, sort of plan things out in pencil, um, but quite often things sort of shift around and um, it's really when the wet media comes into play that I think I make the major kind of decisions of where things are going. Mm -hmm. um, it's surprising how much you can take off or, I don't know, I still use a natural sponge or maybe even when ink has dried, which he thinks indelible, I might sort of uh, put masking tape on and then tear it off, which kind of leaves the white, I mean, it'd be a nightmare for a curator or a conservator because <laughs> the paper skins, but it takes it off really. So there's quite a lot of uh, adjustments that can be made, but actually water, I think watercolour and ink, it is quite a, a one hit, you know, there's something about the translucency of those media, particularly watercolour, where you want the white of the paper to glow through. So if you overwork it, which I invariably do, you know, I have a lot of um, attrition rate with the drawings, which is quite frustrating. Um, I haven't answered your question. What was it, Peter? I, I also wondered if you had studio assistants, but... Studio assistants. I do, uh, not with my drawings, no. I mean, it's quite a... Um, erratic strange behavior for example at the moment I'm drawing in the middle of the night here in the UK because it's so hot <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but uh, I do with my printmaking yes I it's not really a studio assistant I work with a, a master printer um, Amy Jane Blackhall um, at a, a another press um, and yeah I mean I, I think um, and sometimes I might collaborate for example at the moment with a, another artist um, who's helping me fabricate some 3D elements for a piece of work. Mm -hmm. But you no know, drawing I find is a very, for me, a, a quite a autograph autographic kind of personal thing. Yeah. So uh, yeah, I'm usually on my own. Great. Um, speaking about watercolor and sort of the great age of watercolor, um, mm -hmm. in our discussions leading up to this conversation, I was incredibly taken by your affinity to and knowledge of earlier British art, most notably 19th century art by the likes of J.M.W. Turner and romantic concepts such as the sublime. Given that we are having this conversation um, for the Yale Center for British Art, whose collections of this material is unparalleled in the US, I asked you and you kindly agreed to talk about a Turner work in the collection that speaks to you and informs your own art making. And please, please, please don't forget to mention your 2021 BBC Radio 3 program in search of the sublime where you retraced Turner's drawings, 
route on his first Alpine tour in 1802 up to the Mer de Glace. Well, thanks. Thanks for mentioning the radio program, Freda. I think actually the um, it may be a link that will come up in people's chat if they are interested in, in listening. Um, but when I was uh, invited to do this program, we they took me up out onto the glacier, um, the Mer de Glace, um, to follow in Turner's footsteps and hike up the, the glacier, which I had done previously, but um, it was probably about a decade before. Um, and yeah, this amazing watercolour that's in Yale, um, which I think Turner probably, you know, it's likely he made this in the studio. Um, it's a little bit too big for his sketchbook, plus it's kind of highly finished. So um, it, it probably is referencing some of those Alpine sketchbooks from his 1802 tour. Um, so you can see here the Mer de Glace, which is travelling up the valley. And then down to the bottom left hand corner where um, it's actually turning into the Glacier du Bois, which of course these days has disappeared due to uh, glacier retreat and climate warming. Um, and the source of the Arveron River that flows down into Chamonix below. Um, to get up to this position, which I'm pretty, I'm pretty familiar with now where, where this is, um, he would have hiked up. Now you get the train. <laughs> Um, so it was already kind of quite a steep hike to get up to this point. Um, and of course, he was traveling uh, in 1802 during the Napoleonic Wars. So um, there was a short break with the Treaty of Amiens of less than a year where, uh, you know, visitors could, uh, from the UK could go into France. But it would have still been pretty risky and uh, there probably were bandits. And, you know, it was, was not certainly you'd be intrepid to have headed up to France at that point. Um, and so he's hiked up here and uh, during this tour he'd, he'd made like 500 or so watercolours, he, he was really prolific, but um, in, in, well it's certainly in my view, these high alpine uh, sketchbook drawings that he made are absolutely, you know, he's really kind of um, breaking radically new ground with how we see the landscape, how it's represented, ideas of the sublime and, and the kind of grandeur of mountains. Um, so incredible, you can tell, you can see his excitement in those sketchbook drawings and obviously works that came out of them like this. Uh, and I, uh, I walked up with the guide up the glacier, um, uh, you know, on this, on this BBC programme, and I'd shown him another watercolour from the sketchbook, the 1802 sketchbook, and said, do you recognise this? And he said, yeah, yeah, he's French, quite an elderly French guide, like sixth generation Frenchman who, of guiding kind of because the guide sort of tradition in Chamonix is you pass it on from family to family so he was really familiar um, and he hiked on and on and I kept saying isn't it here and he's like no 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 further up further up um, and yeah finally we got up to this point which um, was where he made his Mer de Glace looking up to the Aiguille de Tacoon which is sort of around the corner further up the glacier um, and, you know, even, even today, that's quite a challenging hike. But in the days of when the glacier was this size, you know, you'd have had to have traversed really big seracs and um, kind of uh, crevasses with the car. You know, it would have been like incredibly intrepid. And yeah, and then he made a watercolour, <laughs> which is extraordinary. <laughs> I, I totally, uh, completely admire that he, you know, had, had, had been physically able to do that. Yeah. So yeah, that's fabulous to see that in Yale. I really, it's amazing watercolor. So you talk a lot about Turner and where he would have been when he was drawing. Can you speak more about the idea of viewpoints and framing within drawings and about your own position when you were drawing from this space or from spaces um, out in the field and maybe even touch on uh, Edmund Burke's notion of the sublime? Yes, I, I think, I mean, I'm, my, you know, I'm, I've long been interested in landscape, you know, has, how it has an effect on our senses and our imagination. Um, and of course, you know, our wonder and all before nature um, really draws reference to that um, sense of Edmund Burke's 18th century uh, psychological state that we experience when we're kind of confronted with this immense um, and awful in the real sense of the world. You know, sense of place, um, and usually in 
the uh, sort of romantic sublime period, people would be, people, you know, within the frame, they'd be viewing this kind of immensity of nature um, from a position of safety, like on a, a ledge or, a, or standing on a shoreline looking out at the tumultuous sea or, you know, you'd be kind of looking out at nature. Um, and yeah, so that's something that I've been preoccupied with thinking, well, you know, now today in the 21st century, we've, we've kind of really got quite an altered relationship with nature, you know, the uncertainty of how um, the impacts of climate change are gonna play out in, in, in terms of our environment. Um, you know, we're no longer outside of that frame, you know, we're in it, we're, we're really in the eye of the, of the storm. So I, I kind of want in the work to, in, in the sense of the scale of the work, but also um, the viewpoint and the kind of compositional structuring of the image um, to, to sort of give a slightly unsteady viewpoint that you might feel that it's gonna kind of, um, um, you know, sort of an uneasy picture space. Um, so to, to, to give the viewer a, a, um, perhaps more a physical sense of, of that. Um, I mean, this large watercolour that we're looking at here, which is an ice front in Antarctica, um, I was trying to sort of capture something about the dizzying effects of, of that sense of the carving of the ice, which of course, you know, is happening continuously, um, if anyone's been able to see that in either the Arctic or the Antarctic, you know, there's this kind of constant carving of the ice front into the sea. Um, and, you know, I think uh, that sense of encounter um, is something that I want to try and capture in the work. And can you, can you give us a sense of where you were when you drew this or when you started drawing the sketches for this larger piece? Were you on a boat? Were you on the I glacier? Was on a, uh, no, I was on a boat. I was on a boat, um, which, uh, you know, they can only get in so far. Um, because obviously it's dangerous if, if something carves and you're in the wash of that kind of ice fall. Um, so uh, I suspect this probably was uh, my photographs that I took with a fairly good zoom lens to really get that far in. We weren't literally underneath it. <laughs> I'd yeah, because like it is. It does that, seem. But... <laughs> it does seem precarious. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, wonderful. Thank you. Um, I think we can move on to the next slide. In addition to Turner and Burke, you have been asked to consider the incredibly influential critic, philosopher, and artist John Ruskin, who created and sought works of art that showed a truth to nature, that captured the natural world as truthfully as possible. Ruskin was particularly concerned with recording the effects of the industrial age and what these changes would mean for our relationship to the natural world. Can you speak a little bit about your 2018 commission for the York Art and Abbott Hall Cumbria for the Ruskin, Turner and the Storm Cloud exhibition? Uh, yes, it, it was um, an exhibition that really focused around his Rus John Ruskin's visionary lecture about the storm cloud of the 19th century. Um, and he really railed about um, how the effects of 19th century industrialization was having an impact on air pollution. And, you know, he recognized that, you know, far ahead of his time um, on cities like Manchester, where he said, you know, air quality for workers was really poor. Um, and, you know, that really um, led me on to think about how, you know, it's a very prescient message that he was giving in the 19th century to now, today. Um, and how that could be brought forward into, you know, a comparison to where we are. Um, in 1854, Ruskin, he was always really interested in new technologies and he was one of the first people to make a photographic image of the French Alps. Um, in the left-hand image there is his really beautiful daguerreotype, which he took together with either Frederick Crawley or John Hobbes in 1854. Um, and I decided if I was to revisit and try and find that particular location at the same time of year, the same season, um, and make it make a comparative image. Um, I felt my drawing skills weren't quite up to getting an absolute accuracy, so I decided to use a cyanotype process, a photographic process, um, and 
And there you see it on the right um, in June 2018. It's a kind of empty moraine covered floor. You can just see the remains of the tongue of the glacier coming around the curve of the, um, the valley floor there. Uh, as a comparison to the sea of ice, literally, that, that Ruskin's day would have seen. Um, and I, I don't obviously expected that it would be, you know, vastly reduced. But I, I, what really shocked me was um, I'd been there about a decade before that. And uh, even in those 10 years, it was really like further, further up the valley and, and uh, dramatically retreated. So, um, you know, again, that was a kind of alarm that really it's in our lifetime. These things are happening. And, you know, with things like the glacier, that's very apparent. Um, you know, it's probably one of the most sort of visual, visceral things that we can see uh, in terms of warming, sadly. Yeah. So we have a question um, from uh, the group and actually David Koslow is going to ask, <laughs> is asking about, since we're talking about your influences and looking at the romantics and Ruskin and Turner, are you influenced by Cezanne's rock and quarry paintings? Um, and have you been influenced by Wordsworth, the Prelude series of poems? Oh, um, yes, both actually. I mean, Cezanne is, is uh, a real kind of, um, you know, he really embedded himself into those landscapes and, you know, he, his kind of familiarity with, with his particular uh, locations that he worked from um, and, and his drawings too, which had that incredible uh, volume and um, kind of investigation around the geology and um, sort of strata of place. Uh, I think, uh, Wordsworth too, um, very much, you know, that whole kind of generation of British um, writers and literature and poetry uh, is, is part of, I suppose, the romantic tradition um, and, yeah, informs my work to some extent. Um, it's hard to, I was trying to get myself out of the 19th century and back <laughs> into the 21st. <laughs> Speaking of... Um, <laughs> Your practice is incredibly collaborative, um, not only with artists in your studio and master print printers, which we'll discuss in a moment, and you mentioned earlier, but also with your continuing and ongoing dialogue with scientists. Can you tell us about your fundamental commitment to marrying art and science and how you see the union as enlivening both? Oh, yeah. Well, I certainly um, find it really informative um, to talk with other disciplines. And, and often when I'm developing a project, I speak to, um, or, you know, seek out the expertise from a scientist. Um, and in fact, here's um, Professor Kathy Cashman, who's now a good friend as well. Um, and in fact, we've been on a field trip to Iceland together. Her specialism is volcanology. Um, but I think for me, um, it's probably a kind of one-way trip because I, I get to learn about um, the kind of underlying uh, sort of um, dynamic forces that drive change in the landscape. And obviously, you know, an earth scientist like Kathy, you know, has profound knowledge about how something's come to be the way, you know, the histories of formation or erosion in geology. Um, and one of the things that, uh, well, maybe we both found quite valuable together with another um, Earth scientist Professor Steve Sparks. We um, had a touring exhibition showing my work alongside their research. Uh, and it was really impressive how that brought a completely different audience to our both our respective work. Um, so, you know, I had a, a, a more sort of science um, environment audience to my work, and they perhaps had you know, a different audience to the kinds of academic journals that they'd normally publish in. Um, and it had a really energetic kind of um, schools program. And I, I, yeah, I just think the, the kind of bringing together arts and science, the humanities and sciences is, is a really good way to, effective way to get a message. Yeah. Great. Um, let's move on. Um, I love this piece. Um, <laughs> your interest in science is not only about environmental change and the impact of humankind on nature. You're also very particular about the materials you use to make your drawings and often employ naturally occurring materials to convey meaning in your work. 
which we'll address soon. Uh, for now, can you talk about how this fabulous chalk drawing on a blackboard, um, how in this work, media actually is metaphor? Uh, yes, as I, as I, um, as perhaps I've sort of alluded to already in the media of the, the process, you know, the marriage of the image is something that I'm really trying to sort of achieve in the work. And um, for example, this piece, which has, it's made with just drawing chalk uh, on a blackboard surface. So you could literally wipe it away with your hand. Um, mm. That that seems sort of appropriate for the, the more, you know, the elusiveness of a glacier. It's a tide water glacier um, that I was drawing here. Um, and I do think that um, sort of metaphorical stand in, for, for, for a subject, you know, that you're using the media that perhaps could, um, I mean, in some of the later, perhaps we'll move on to something where I've actually used earth materials from the landscape as well. Uh, yes. But I think, yeah, there's something quite sort of uh, direct about that with drawing, the process of drawing that I enjoy. Great. Um, our world is changing so fast and it's so much more fragile than at least I ever imagined. You capture that fragility so well, and you're able to do that at the same time as celebrating uh, the beauty, the absolute beauty of nature. Can you speak about the idea of beauty and monumentality in relation to nightbergs? Um, well, the, the, the kind of wonder and beauty of, of what I can see when I'm out in the landscape is something I really want to try and capture, but... Um, of course, that's underscored as well by our awareness about fragility. Um, and again, the kind of means of doing that is, is kind of something I want to suggest in the work. Um, I mean, literally some of these locations, they're sort of eerie, ethereal light that you're kind of seeing. Um, and here I was, I think, on the um, icebreaker, HMS protector, uh, which would sort of, you know, inch its way through these incredible kind of like the size of buildings literally some of these bergs um and yeah i was trying to sort of think of ways to to try and suggest that in the the media the, the watercolor here again the um the night sky is really pristine so you've got this incredible kind of cosmic sense of um the depth of the, the night sky which you know we rarely see here in the uk um and i, I think you know, there's something about that sense of reverie or introspection that you you kind of um, you know without it's it's hard because I, I obviously it's a romantic notion of of place but and but it's very real too and and uh, I want to it could be taken on a level of just looking at them in terms of beauty but I I feel uh, hopefully it's pretty unavoidable that you're also going to be reminded of of what exactly you know, what is happening in these places right now. Yeah, yeah, and your next piece very much addresses what's happening in these spaces now. Um, I like the idea of wonder and finding beauty in the extremes, and obviously wildfires are a huge environmental, economic, and political issue right now. They are to me the definition of the sublime in the sense of evoking both terror and awe. Um, when approaching the subject of wildfire, you chose to create an installation, uh, something immersive outside of a one uh, of a two dimensional drawing, incorporating three dimensions, um, three dimensional elements for the first time in your artistic practice. Can you can you talk more about that? Uh, well, yes. I just to say, I'm obviously deeply, you know, alarmed about the situation in the USA. You know, it must. I can't even imagine how that must impact on people's um lives in terms of the of, of what we're seeing on, on the news here um in the uk we we too have increasing um wildfire um on a much much smaller scale but um they're becoming more uh common with the extreme heat and uh drought conditions that are happening um and i've been thinking about that and uh I've been in Utah and Arizona a while back and seen some of them are controlled forest fires there, but you know, you have this kind of really kind of almost apocalyptic looking landscapes. Um, and uh, the, there was a local fire in a forest in Dorset um, in Wareham uh, a few years back, in fact, during COVID and I got the opportunity to make this ridiculously big 
I think it's five meters wide, which is in feet. Maybe that's about 15 feet wide, or is that more than that? Five feet. Yeah, 15 feet wide by, you know, it's big. Um, and so I, I spoke to Forestry England, who control that particular forest and said, could I retrieve some of the material? And um, I made the drawing, the backdrop drawing in charcoal, uh, and then some of the carbonized um, timber is reclaimed from the forest. And then a few trees that I also um, salvaged from elsewhere. So, you know, the, the, the drawing is the backdrop, and then we've got these kind of 3D these trees that you could sort of almost walk into. Um, and I, yeah, I wanted the viewer to get more of a sense of being in that space, um, you know, that, that hopefully that would be a bit of a reminder too that, you know, we're on this global increase of forest fires that's, that's really alarming. Yeah. 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 Can we um, skip ahead to broken terrain? Yes. <laughs> We're going to turn away for a second from drawing, although I know um, in your practice, drawings and prints are closely related. Um, this print is um, of broken terrain, and it's uh, a technique that sort of evoke, you use different techniques to evoke sort of this um, wondrously beautiful scene. Um, you seem to rely on intaglio techniques and the gorgeous layering of almost transparent colors of aquatint. Um, oh, uh, and polygraver. You also create grainy swatches of terrain through the use of volcanic ash. Um, and here I want to just point you to your discussion of earth materials and how they add layers of meaning to your works. Um, and we can talk about this and look at some of the um, earth materials you've gathered yourself. Yes, thank you. Thanks. So, I mean, obviously, we're now we're into a volcanic landscape, so uh, that's really down to the primordial forces of nature um, and, you know, out of our control, basically. <laughs> um, so uh, um, I was really lucky in 2017, um, I got this opportunity to be um, artist in resident at Volcanoes National Park on Big Island, Hawaii. Um, and I literally got to live on the edge of a volcano, which was, you know, the world's most active volcano, I think, Kilauea. Um, and this this is uh, Kilauea Iki, which is uh, slightly adjacent to Kilauea, a slightly smaller crater. Um, and if you walk down onto the pavement floor of the crater, it's like hot. And obviously there's this kind of upthrust of, um, uh, of the lava pavement here, which um, you know, it seems quite kind of alarming when you're when you're <laughs> on it. Um, it's I think it's pushed um, up by the pressure of the um, of obviously the seismic forces below. Um, and yeah, I gathered up volcanic ash off the uh, floor of the, the pavement. And uh, I think you could probably just see it there in the um, sort of pinks uh, and, and kind of brown tints of the crater there, um, crater, the kind of broken area there. Um, and I make the images in terms of the artwork using a, a, an Indian ink, which I've then incorporated the ash into the ink. So hence the texture, and then that's captured in the plate making process, um, which as you mentioned, um, you know, I'm sort of layering that. There's two plates involved with this image, one for the pinky brown and then one for the darker tone that gets printed down over the top. Uh, but I, I, yeah, there's something about that materiality of the, of the ash that it's actually representing the thing that it you know is actually made from <laughs> um i've got a further image just to show yeah. you so it looks slightly dubious on the left but anyway that's ash <laughs> which is from various locations um and uh yeah I, I think there's something um sort of metaphorical about that which i mentioned earlier which i sort of standing in for the place that, that it's actually drawing that, that i enjoy Wonderful. If we can just flip to the last slide, I just want to ask you um, one last question. I think it's fitting that we're ending our discussion with drawings that you made during your residency in Hawaii's Big Island, a place that I visited for over 20 years that I love uh, very much, um, not as an active observer or witness um, like you have, but really as a mere tourist. Can you speak about 
your experience in this storied landscape about its history and the intense connection the Hawaiian communities have with their environment, with nature. And can you speak about how this connection, as well as your own amazement at its beauty informs drawings such as this fabulous night plume? Well, it, it was kind of quite haunting because I, as I say, I was on the edge of the crater where I was staying in, in this small house on my own. And yeah, it had this incredible sort of sulfurous um, glow as the plume came up out of the crater, the sort of um, glow of the lava would illuminate it. Um, and yeah, I, I uh, made the story using a combination of Indian ink and again, ash that I gathered from the site. Um, and the, there was something um, really about that place which seemed quite um, extraordinary. I mean, one of the things that I think really altered my perception about landscape was learning and speaking to local people uh, about their relationship with living in that very volatile place, um, you know, it's their home. Um, I thought it would be really alarming and kind of negative that you could have an, a, a volcano eruption um, or even a tsunami if you were down on the coast. It seemed like everywhere there was a hazard. They had um, uh, seismic earthquake events literally every day. Um, and um, that that seemed to me kind of like quite sort of terrifying. But actually local Hawaiians that I spoke to were so connected to where they live. You know, they they didn't see that. They saw that as a sort of cycle of guys I was being to, you know, that there was a cycle of, renewal and uh you know that, that that was that was the part of their nature that the, the nature that they were part of you know rather than a, an apocalyptic kind of understanding of place um, and of course the hawaiian oral traditions of of uh of seeing the volcano as an embodiment of their deity pele um and you know the various sort of storied events that happened around her, um, that, that her wrathful vengeance. Um, it's a fascinating um, uh, kind of record that, that's passed on from, from generation to generation. Um, and also, I guess that sort of faith of animism also really interested me that, that it's a kind of spirit-based faith where your you know, natural phenomena, even, even a, a kind of cloud or a, um, something that seemed inanimate would, would have a spiritual kind of agency um, uh, and I, I, I like the idea that the substance of place is um, it holds in its memory a kind of physical entity um, and yeah that again that seemed to resonate with the actual earth of the place um, and you know there's something metaphorical in that extent between drawing and and sort of a standing in for something um, and I suppose you know that unstable I mean many many cultures who have a, a much stronger understanding and connection with their with their lands with their with their environment um, which I guess you know in our kind of northern hemisphere existence you know I, I think we're we're fairly disconnected now um, and you know being being in that place was quite a salutary experience you know I, I think you know we need to get really reconnect that's my that's my message to myself yeah thank you thank you thank you so much <laughs> um we're gonna Thanks. open it up to questions now Oops, sorry stop sharing <laughs> um i'm gonna start with a um a question about drawing. Um, drawing seems to be a very special um, way of making for you um, and a uh, special understanding for you. Can you talk about what drew you to drawing? Well, do you know, I, I just, I think I could draw, I definitely felt competent, you know, I wanted to communicate the drawing before I could speak. I can remember that. And I do think that's something that most of us have as an experience from childhood. And I'm just sorry that, that it's not uh, a language that we carry on into adult life, you know, in a conscious way. I mean, everyone draws to as a diagram or a description of something. Um, but I think the emotional uh, kind of investment of drawing is something that is really, the creativity of that is really important. So anyway, yes, I, 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 can, uh, I can say that it's not something, it's probably learned as well, but 
it's something I've always felt it's kind of comfortably a way of communicating. Great. Um, this is a question. Um, how important is your use of expressive gesture behind realism? The, they feel your works feel very abstract. How would you ever would you ever consider depicting inhabited landscapes? Mm, right. Um, yes, I suppose the, the the in answering the point around abstraction and uh, the kind of gesture of drawing, I think it it is it is to do with that. I mean, image making. I think the graphic. Kind of power of image making has got uh, a kind of abstracted set you know our eye recognizes that certain sort of um you know has impact in so i know that's what i'm looking for when i'm trying to compose a, an image um to sort of arrest the eye um i'm not much alone in that obviously that's that's about image making um but uh, I think abstraction definitely comes into that, despite the fact that my work is so, you know, it is completely rooted in the, the kind of realism, whatever that is, of out there. Um, so it's a, a kind of balancing between the two. Um, and the other point, which was, um, remind me, Freda. Um, putting people into your yes. landscapes. Peopling. I sometimes have an indicator of human uh, endeavour within an image, but yeah, you're right. I rarely actually have a figure, partly just in terms of narrative. I, I don't really want to sort of um, frame it in terms of time or um, uh, a kind of, I, I guess I want the viewer to be the inhabitant of the place. So uh, it's, I feel it's a sort of barrier if you're kind of standing on the fur sort of experience, if that makes mm -hmm. sense. Yes, and it also gives a sense of uh, the human presence is there because of the sort of transformation and destruction of the landscape. So it sort of looms large anyway. Um, I'm hesitating from saying, you know, a post-apocalyptic view because I'm not, right. you know, we're, we're in there still. <laughs> we're hanging on in there as a species. Yeah. That's right. Um, I have a, a great question from a former colleague, Julian Forrester, um, who was very interested in your beautiful drawing, Tidewater Glacier. Uh, where you use the blackboard as a support. Um, and she says that the largest and most interesting sketchbook that Turner took on his 1802 tour, 1802 tour is the saint Goutard and Mont Blanc sketchbook, um, which he always made his own sketchbooks and he prepared all the sheets in advance with gray wash and used chalks and graphite to make on-site drawings. Um, could you, Emma, talk about your experience of working from light, I'm sorry, from dark to light which is also akin to mezzotint, a medium that Turner particularly favored in relation to starting with a white space for your watercolors. Well, that's, thank you, Gillian. Yeah, that's that's something that I, I think, because I, I perceive things, I mean, I'm, I'm not colorblind, but I do look at the world in terms of tonality. And uh, so, you know, working from a dark to light um, is, we didn't talk about the woodcut actually, Freda, did we? But we didn't have time. But the, uh, the the idea of, say, a relief print where you're chiseling out your white highlights from a dark background, it's like you're illuminating that image. And I I find that it's all this sort of godlike, you know, you're the one sort of deciding where the light's going to be cast. Um, I haven't ever tried Mexitin, but... Uh, uh, I have some, made some drawings where I've used my um, drawing support as a toned mid-tone, so more of a sort of chiaroscuro drawing where I'm sort of working from light and dark, you know, my mid-tone is the paper surface, uh, which I believe is probably what Turner was doing with those St. Gotthard, um, amazing, God, made, yeah, amazing images. Um, but yeah, it, the, the kind of working around illuminating something is definitely what kind of interests me um, and yeah that could be quite monochrome and not really a colorist in that sense mm, mm. um i think we can take two more questions one is how has traveling and experiencing such ephemeral and unstable environments affected how you experience the place where you live your home um i think that's an interesting question that's a nice, yes, it is. And I, um, yeah, I mean, I, I obviously, 
live in the UK and I sometimes like the um, the forest fire, which is, is fairly local to me, um, and other subjects, perhaps coastal um, subjects that I might, my, you know, British coastline is amazing. Um, but more often than not, yes, my research takes me a lot further than, than the UK um, and I'm not from these landscapes that I'm depicting. So there's a lot of ethical kind of questions really in my mind around uh, obviously my carbon footprint, I'm flying to, you know, a location, you know, it would, would, it would be necessary, obviously, um, you know, I have to really turn over what, what I'm going to get from that. It might be two years worth of work that um, I might gain from a particular research trip. So I'm hoping that that justifies that, that particular, you know, carbon emission. Um, and also it's, it's, it is because the work's so rooted in being in front of something, um, it's hard to source imagery like secondhand without being there. Um, but yes, I, I think that's a really um, sensitively worded question, which I, I challenge myself on all the time. And I also do feel particularly, um, I, I, I mean, Antarctica and Svalbard are less, not fraught, but you know, they, they're indigenous, Antarctica there's no indigenous population apart from you know scientists that are rather are there under sort of other um, artificially supported means um, and uh, you know I, I feel that uh, really we should be hearing the voices of people that live in these places so for example Greenland would be quite hard to to work from as an outside artist I, I would feel kind of that was would be maybe questionable I don't know for, for myself I, yeah, that's so. There's a, a lot of issues around, you know. Me, I, I'm a tourist. I'm I'm visiting somewhere. Uh, I'm not. I'm not living there. I don't know it profoundly. So, yeah, I was probably so, asked innocently that question, and it's yes. <laughs> unleashed a whole lot of <laughs> angst in my reply. Thank you. So, as the last question, um, just in terms of where you're going next, what's what's your next project? Oh, thank you. Uh, well, I uh, actually it does bring me to home. I've got a show approaching um, next early next year um, at the Towner Museum in Eastbourne, which is a beautiful museum on the British on the Sussex coast, southeast coastline. Uh, and I'm looking to try and connect really something that's kind of seemingly remote, polar ice sheet melt. So obviously my sort of work I've been doing in the Arctic in Svalbard and down in Antarctica looking at the ice sheets and glaciers um, and then bringing that to well what's happening to sea level rise you know we we can see this on our doorstep everyone can you know globally with um, the impact that's having and continues to have on flooding and coastal erosion um, so I'm hoping to somehow bring those two things together in the gallery space to try and sort of connect local audiences with with something that's that's obviously on a, on a much bigger global level well, thank you so much. Hopefully we can get you over to Connecticut and to Yale at some point soon. Uh, this has been a really wonderful experience for me. Thank you so much. And thank you everyone for coming to hear Emma. Thank you, Freda. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye.